is kind of this lacy, remember that reticulated, that, that term I used, um, uh, kind of a bluish discoloration of that. It's that lacy look. Um, the thing, there is a something else called cutis marmorata telangiectatic congenita that is a something that will persist, okay? And the feet and hands may have more edema associated with it. If it's something like that, then you need to refer them on to um, a dermatologist or Yes, dermatologist. If it, if it resolves, though, quite quickly with just warming of their body, then just reassure and say that's going to happen for a few weeks, but, but it will stop. Okay? And here's some pictures. Those little purpley blue feet, and then that reticulated, real lacy bluishness of the, the body. Okay, another one that is completely benign but can be a little nerve-wracking as a newborn or first-time mom or dad is this erythema toxicum neonatorum. And this is a kind of a pustular, small little pustules that occur within the first couple of days of life. It uh, resolves completely on its own. We don't have any idea really what causes this rash. Most of these rashes that I'm talking about in the neonate stage. We have no idea why um, why this happens. We're still trying to figure that out. Um, I think the main thing is just reassurance. No, you can reassure mom and dad that this is, we see this in 70% of full term infants. Um, you get kind of this blotchy um, red macules, papules that evolve into small little pustules with a broad erythematous base and it has the term, they, the kiddo looks flea bitten. So you might remember that little, little descriptive term. And that's what you're going to see. Again, we're going to talk about neonatal acne. That's mainly just going to be on the face. This is going to be start on the face but, but uh, travel southward. As you can see, the tiny, tiny little pustules um, with that erythematous base. All right, another benign um, pustular rash um, is transient neonatal pustular melanosis. This is a lot less common than the other one. Um, this one you're going to see more in darker skinned individuals, especially African and American male babies. Um, oftentimes present at birth or, you know, within a few days. Again, these are small, small pustules but without that erythematous space. And when they resolve, they leave a little bit of a post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, like we've talked about, with that little comrade of scale. And see how that little scale right around the very edge? That's what you call that comrade. So again, look at the pustules there no significant erythema associated like with the other. And then another pustular rash is um, acropustulosis of infancy. Acro, again, feet and hands. So you're going to see this primarily on, on the feet and hands. Now this one is a little bit different in the fact those other two resolve after a few days to a few weeks. This one can go on intermittently for two to three years. And it is, the others are completely asymptomatic. This one has quite a bit of itching associated with it. So they'll have a bout of this pustular eruption on their feet and hands, kind of like the lateral and plantar aspects of the feet. <clears throat> and it will take a, a couple of weeks to resolve, two or three weeks to resolve, and then they'll, you know, every couple of weeks have another bout of this. And they're, they're, it's usually quite pruritic, intensely pruritic. But usually it will decrease in frequency and severity, and then it'll just eventually stop at about two to three years of age. Now this one, to me, it would look identical to um, scabies. And I suspect if you saw this, I'm probably going to empirically treat them for scabies. You know, even if I get, I do the skin scraping, um, look for the little scabies under, underneath the microscope. Even if I didn't see it though, 
I'm going to treat them, especially if there's anybody else in the family who's complaining about itching. If you treat them and nobody else in the family has it and it's just not resolving, then you might, you know, think more likely that it that it is this the acrocostulosis. And the fact that I mean, occasionally it can be more wider spread, but much more often just the feet and hands. So if you have just this vesicular rash to the feet and hands versus other parts of the body, like you will see with scabies, um, that will help differentiate. I did in my reading. I did. I didn't know this beforehand, but um, they have had a number of cases where. This kind of developed after a case of, of uh, scabies, almost like an id reaction where the body just gets into high gear and they just continue to have a rash. But they've also had cases without any documented scabies. So, Okay, um, and then you have miliaria. You have two types of miliaria, um, miliaria crystallina and, and um, miliaria rubra. The difference, both of these are due to uh, sweat gland, not sweat duct obstruction and immaturity of their little sweat glands and ducts. Um, the crystallina occurs higher up in the duct. The, the rubra tends to occur lower in the duct. So you have a little bit more of an inflammatory reaction and you have redness. With the miliaria crystallina, when the, they get hot, a little baby gets overheated, they will form these tiny, tiny little um, uh, vesicles without erythema. Now the miliaria rubra, which we also call prickly heat, you're going to see um, the, the vesicles with surrounding redness. Again, this will completely resolve as the, the kiddo cools off. And again, this will eventually uh, take care of itself. And there on screen left is your miliaria crystallina and then your rubra, so prickly heat. Very, very common. And then your neonatal or infantile acne, again, that's going to be more just to the face. Um, tends to look just like regular acne, inflammatory papules, pustules. Occasionally, you can have cystic lesions. I remember seeing a little little one that had cystic lesions, and I, that was the first and only time I, I'd seen that. Um, fairly common, about 20% of your newborns. <coughs> usually within the first few weeks of life, but it occasionally can be delayed. It's thought, again, we don't know 100%, but it's thought in the neonatal stage that it may be the body's of an inflammatory reaction to that malassezia or pityrosporum yeast on the skin. And so in that age group, you might treat it with anti yeast type of medicines. As they get a little bit older in infantile stages, um, it's probably more the female from maternal androgens and um, that you might think more of uh, your topical antibiotic. <coughs> now again on a little baby, again you don't have to treat it because it will eventually resolve on its own. <coughs> if mom is just hypersensitive about everything, you can try some treatment. Um, but I'd probably try to discourage it. Again, a lot of the topical medicines for acne can be very dry and irritating, and then you're, you have another problem on your hands. And there you go. And then they're in college. <laughs> no, she's actually doing very, very well. So, oh my gosh, this was so funny. I'm sorry, I'm diverting. Um, so she called. So this weekend we talked to her, and she was talking about going to um, a Hawaiian themed party, and so she was going to maybe go to Party City or something like that and buy one of those flower lays or whatever. So then we didn't hear anything from her that later that night. And then the next day she calls us. Hi, how are you? 
she calls us and um, lo and behold there's a, a male freshman golfer that she's kind of you know made friends with because she has a class or two together and she's talked about his name before and she said that he had asked her to go to this party with her so she's like oh, okay sure whatever and so then after that she's talking with other girls on her floor and she's like so are you guys going to this Hawaiian thing party and they're like uh, no that's an invite only date party a fraternity party <laughs> so then she got all puckered you know and was like oh my god this is a date <laughs> I would have laid my, or I would have paid money to be up there witnessing all this but so she ended up going with him and had a good time so, yeah she just gets very nervous about such things so. Shocker, can you imagine? <laughs> that apple doesn't fall too far, too far from the tree, now does it? Okay, so diaper dermatitis. Uh, again, you've got your allergic. I know we've been through this before. Just a quick refresher. Irritant, where there's, you know, things like feces, urine, occlusion that just irritate the skin and kind of get an inflammatory reaction. And then you have true aller aller allergic reactions. They are allergic to, like if you rub poison ivy on their skin, <clears throat> such as fragrances and preservatives. But even those can cause an irritant reaction rather than a true allergic reaction. Um, remember, your, your irritant diaper dermatitis is by far the most common. Either one of these tend to spare the folds. Um, uh, you just want to gently cleanse because they can get pretty raw and irritated and then use some kind of a barrier whether it's um, Vaseline, Aquaphor, just plain Desitin. I love CeraVe ointment too, especially for on the face because CeraVe, have you guys heard of CeraVe products? Mm -hmm. I love CeraVe products. Um, what's nice about the CeraVe ointment, it's a greasier, heavier ointment, um, but it won't clog the pores like plain old aquifer will, so not so such a problem on the bottom, but when you're talking on the face. Um, you may need a low potency steroid cream or ointment. I would probably go with an ointment just because again if they've got some open sores just from the irritation, the ointments tend to burn less. So um, but again, remember any inclusive effect of the diaper makes that category, you know, six steroid work much stronger so you always want to go on the lighter side with that <coughs> so that would make for a grouchy baby don't you think or the bottom diaper candidiasis again the main things you want to look for are those satellite lesions and tends to the intertriginous the the leg creases are involved. And there you go. <clears throat> Thrush oral candidiasis, very, very common. I know Emma had that. Um, these white patches on the, the tongue or, or buccal mucosa, even the uh, gingiva, can scrape off and leave um, redness below that. My statin solution where they have a glucosal oral solution, which is very expensive. If it just persists and you're treating it, you might want to check that they're not immunocompromised. Okay. Or that purple uh, gentian violet. Mm -hmm. Has any, any parents had that done on their kiddos? I feel like that's the Yeah. Um, that we would use that, well, again, um, Oral candidiasis is in a, in a kiddo is going to be seen in pediatrics or family medicine. I never saw that in dermatology, but we would use that gentian violet, that purple uh, solution dye. Um, sometimes they'll just rub that in the oral mucosa and that will help take care of that. We used it more in intertriginous areas. Okay talk about a few vascular malformations. First thing we're going to talk about are some capillary um, malformations, your salmon patch and port wine stain, and then we'll briefly talk about venous malformation and AV malformation. All right, salmon patch, incredibly common. 
um, 60 to 70 percent of newborns. You have two types of, that you see, the stork bite that is back here, and the angel kiss that is up here in the glabellar region, uh, forehead, upper eyelids, <clears throat> sometimes the sacrum. I don't know if I've ever seen it back there. The face usually fades over you know, in about a year or so. So again, reassuring mom and dad that that should resolve on its own. The, the nape of the neck, though, tends to be chronic. And you, I'm amazed at how many people have that. Um, I know my husband has that, and every time you're looking around doing a, a skin exam, I'm, I'm amazed at the number of those you see. But completely harmless, just, um, you know, reassurance. And they're your, your angel's kiss and your stork bite. Now, Port Rainstain is a capillary malformation, but this one is a little bit more of a nuisance. Um, thank goodness it's not near as, as common. Um, this one, though, does not resolve, um, and it actually tends to get worse. It tends to become darker, and the tissue tends to thicken up, um, you know, up as they get older. You get hypertrophy of the underlying tissue, so it just gets thicker and more prominent. Head and neck on one side is the most common. One area I do want you to be aware of is if you have this that involves, again, that first uh, division of the trigeminal nerve, it can, that can have, um, glaucoma potentially so you always want to refer this kiddo to for an eye exam and with a pediatric ophthalmologist it can also be associated with a condition called sturge weber syndrome now the glaucoma can be present without the sturge weber syndrome okay so you always want to refer on sturge weber syndrome is more of a a genetic condition that's associated with this um, this port wine stain. They also have angiomas, you know, more internally on the brain, um, mental retardation, glaucoma, and hemiplegia paralysis. You know, they do have uh, laser pulse dye laser treatments. It just takes a bunch of them, and they are really fantastic. I feel bad for people with that. Mm -hmm. So they tend to be a much more brighter red, especially as they get older, and that, that tissue will thicken up. All right, venous malformation. Again, this is a um, the venous system, so it is a, a slow flow, where arterial is your um, high flow abnormality. Uh, now these, can be, especially as they get older, can be a little painful and symptomatic. Um, but on exam, they tend to have this bluish, purplish discoloration and kind of these dilated papules and nodules, kind of a tortuous look to them. Uh, deeper lesions um, can just have this subtle blue hue and feel softer. They can they compress with this ropey texture, and here's kind of an example of that. These tend to get a little bit more prominent as well as they get older and can become more symptomatic, more have more pain involved, probably depending on where they are. I would, if they're worried about it, I would probably refer them on to a, a vascular surgeon and have them evaluate for that. Um, now, looking at that, it could be mistaken for uh, <coughs> An infantile hemangioma that we're going to talk about, um, a deeper one. But this one doesn't clear. The other one will that we're going to talk about. Now, an AV malformation, that's, you know, you don't want to mess with those. Those need to be evaluated um, via probably an ultrasound or an MRI or an MRA. Um, this is when you have a, a communication between an artery and a vein. That's not supposed to be there. Um, you certainly don't want to go biopsy in something like this because that's just not good. So again, this is going to be a more tense. You may feel a thrill with that. 
um, purplish, warm hair growth. Again, it, it's got ample amount of blood supply there, so you're going to have excessive growth with this as well. Infantile, am, am I going too fast? We follow me just fine. Yeah. Infantile and angioma, these are very, very common. Um, <clears throat> at least we see it a lot in dermatology. Uh, about a third of them are present at birth or, short, or, you know, and they can develop. Oftentimes what I would hear is people, parents would say, it just looked like a little scratch and it eventually just grew. It tend, these tend to grow over the first year and then they just become stable and then they, they start to involute. Involute is that term we use for it starts to clear, go away on its own. <clears throat> So, ten, so again, I think informing your parents of kind of what to expect. This is going to get bigger and more noticeable over the first year. Then it's going to kind of stay s stable. And the large, large majority of these will completely take care of themselves. Your body can do a better job taking care of it than a knife can. Okay, because all these parents want this gone. And I think letting them know that the body will do this for the large, large majority of them. All right, so when it involutes, when it starts to go away, you're going to see these little islands of, of whiteness within that. Let me see if I've got a picture. Okay, here's a picture. Screen left is your typical hemangioma, and the one on screen right, you can see those little patches, islands of, of whiteness. Now sometimes when they do that, it's, it's losing that blood supply. So sometimes it can develop little ulcers or sores, and that will freak out a parent. And they're like, oh my gosh, it's, you know, it's getting sores on it. What's going on here? And just reassure them, that is a normal thing. That's telling us that your body is, is getting this to go away. Um, you just treat it like any other little wound to the skin, just clean it. And I always recommend to keep it a little greasy with Vaseline or Aquaphor or, or my beloved CeraVe oil. <laughs> okay, I think we talked about everything there. So these are tend to be bright red early on and then become more dull as they start to end. All right, so the, the typical saying is that by, the, by 10 years of age, about... 90, almost 100% are gone. So again, what I tell my parents is by three years of age, about 30% of the kiddos that have these, they'll be gone by then. 50% uh, by age five, 70% by, or 95% by age seven. So I usually say by 10 years of age, this should be gone. Now sometimes, now when it resolves, it oftentimes will leave a little bit of those atrophic area looks like a kind of a scar uh, but usually it's it's not very noticeable at all now if you have them that are deeper um, or very very large um, sometimes as that results there'll be a lot of redundant skin excess skin that can then be cut out and and made more taut now sometimes they will involve areas that are important, such as the eye, such as the nose, such as the mouth, such as the anus, daily functioning, um, and that's when you want to consider treating these. One other important thing to know is if a, if a kiddo has more than five of these on their skin, then they have a higher chance of having these same sorts of things internally on the organs, especially the liver. So you may want to consider getting an ultrasound of the liver if they have more than five of these on the skin. Most people don't. It's usually one or two. So most of these don't require any treatment at all. Just reassuring mom and dad that the body will take care of these. Um, I'm not going to get into the, the treatment. We used to use high dose steroids or intralesional steroids. Can you imagine that? In a, a little baby. Now they're using a lot of topical or oral propranolol, um, which is what I'm on right now, <laughs> as I've told you. 
and it, it can work really well. You have to start it earlier. If it's too advanced, then it doesn't do as, as well. There are a couple, bless you. There are a couple of um, syndromes that an infantile hemangioma can be associated with. Um, this midline, especially to the lumbosacral region, you can have some vertebral or the spinal involvement or gastro or the vertebral uh, GU anomalies, and you need to evaluate that. If you have a very massive large one on the face and scalp, it can be associated with this face syndrome, which stands for, I'll let you read it, um, but it has some extra cutaneous other than skin involvement and that needs to be evaluated. And referred on. You guys talked about Mongolian spots? Okay. Mongolian spots, are, you generally see these again in darker skinned individuals. Um, they have this kind of poorly circumscribed, it's, not, it's kind of hard to tell where it starts and where it stops grayish to bluish to sometimes even a grayish color. Um, it looks very much like a bruise. All right. So I think what's important to know is that this can happen and it will resolve. It's not a bruise. It just can be mistaken for a bruise. And you don't want to turn somebody in for child abuse when it's just a Mongolian spot. Okay. So 80 to 90% of your black infants, 75% of your Asians, only 10% of your Caucasians. So again, they're darker skinned individuals. Lumbosacral region is where you're going to see the predominant number of these. And again, no treatment is needed. These will fade. Again, just giving reassurance. So look at that. That could look just like a, a bruise. Like, oh my God, what'd you do to your baby? And it's just, they were just born with that. Okay, a mole, there's a thing called an epidermal nevus. Um, these tend to, it's just a mole, tends to be linear like that though. Um, and as they get older, it, you know, kind of a light brown, hyperpigmented macules, and then they turn into plaques. And they tend to get very warty looking up into the teenage years, and that's a good example of one. People, as they turn teenager, I mean, they're hyper-conscious of, self-conscious of everything, but, um, you know, you'd have to cut those out. Sometimes, though, what I would do is just kind of trim the top legs, trim that warty looking stuff off. It will grow back, but at least temporarily, it, it cosmetically looks better. Sebaceous nevus. Um, or nevus sebaceous, I've heard it called both ways. These tend to be more on the face, especially the scalp. They tend to be kind of oval shaped and have more of a yellow, orangey look to them. Uh, and this is, again, is just a type of mole. As kiddos get older, especially up into the teenage years, it will get more, it will get bigger and more warty looking. One thing about this is there is a very small chance of it of an area of that turning into a basal cell in adulthood. So um, there's no huge rush, but oftentimes people will want to electively get this cut out. Um, but there's no huge rush. You can wait until teenage years or after. Um, but just so, if you've got a person that doesn't want that, that's fine, but they just have to be made aware to, to keep a close eye on it, watch for any changes with it. Okay. And here's a picture of that. So again, that has a real distinct yellow-orange color to it that most molds do not. And then just your congenital pigmented molds. Um, you can be born with these or they can be, um, you know, appear uh, weeks to months after birth. Some, you have small congenital nevi, medium-sized congenital nevi, and giant congenital nevi. 
The giant ones are really the only ones of concern because those do have a greater risk, and we're talking 20 centimeters or bigger. So this is a big, where it's taken, you know, a big chunk of the body. <clears throat> These have a 2 to 15 percent greater risk of developing melanoma. And if they do, they tend to do it early on in the first decade of life. So you really, oftentimes they'll do uh, serial excisions, you know, take the, the center part out, let it heal up, and then take another, you know, like that, so you're not with the skin stretch out and such. Um, but I think oftentimes these will have hair within them, these congenital molds will have hair in them or have darker spots within them. Again, I think just reassuring that the hair in moles is a sign of that it was more congenital, more from birth. These will get, you know, more hair growth as they get older. And again, the spots within, I would take a picture of it and leave that in my electronic medical record and and look at that every time I'm seeing them. It's going to obviously grow with the kiddo, um, but the spots within shouldn't be changing. And if, if you notice that they are, then I would biopsy that area. So again, the really large ones are the ones you need to be careful about. All right, angiofibroma. These are small reddish to brown little papules typically on the face. Um, they can almost look like acne bumps. <clears throat> now, any of us can have these, you know, one or two, a handful of them, and that's completely normal. When they are in large numbers, though, and they are continuing to get in greater numbers, that's when you need to be concerned about a condition that it can, these can be associated with tuberous sclerosis. And again, this is a genetic disorder that's associated with having these multiple angiofibromas, epilepsy, and mental retardation. Uh, you want to ask about family history. If I was suspicious, I'm going to be referring to genetics. OU has a genetics department. That's where I would be referring them to. They are at greater risk of, of having um, tumors, cancers, uh, so, you know, we just need to make sure that they are being followed and monitored for these cancers or tumors adequately. There are a few other skin findings that can be associated with tuberous sclerosis, and that is called an ash leaf macule. This is a light patch, a hypopigmented macule or patch. A chagrin patch, which is a collagenoma, so that's going to be more raised and firm on the skin. Look kind of skin colored, but just lift it up off the skin. Periungal around the, the fingernails, fibromas there, and cathode spots, those uniformly pigmented light brown macules. They for sure need referral to ophthalmology and appropriate imaging studies where they can get these tumors, and I would refer on to genetics. But be aware of what angio of large numbers of angiomas are associated with and some of these other skin findings. On screen left is uh, uh, angi angiofibroma. Um, but just a, a normal one. Uh, widespread ones, though, this young person has tuberous sclerosis. There's an ash leaf macule and a chagrin patch. A periungal fibroma and the multiple cafe lace box. Neurofibroma. This is another something that can be in small numbers, completely appropriate and completely normal. Um, but in the large numbers and growing numbers, that can be associated with a condition called neurofibromatosis. 
These clinically tend to be kind of skin colored to pinkish, very soft, um, almost like they're hollow inside. Uh, neurofibromatosis is an autosomal, autosomal dominant uh, syndrome. It can have changes with, in the nervous system, bones, and the skin. There's a number of different types. I don't care if you know that or not. NF1 is by far the most common. And probably you're going to be referring on to a geneticist to, to figure out which type they have. They also, the NF1 is also associated with other skin findings, such as an increased number of cafe au lait spots, axillary freckles, and lish nodules. That's an abnormality in the eye, in the iris, that you can't see without an ophthalmologist looking back there. So these two, this NF1, they're at greater risk of developing malignancies, so they need to be appropriately monitored. The definition of a cafe au lait spot is one of these lesions that's at least a centimeter in size or greater, and, in it, and neurofibromatosis, you have to have six or greater, or right? I would be familiar with that. And the diagnosis of NF1 requires two of the seven criteria. If they have six or more cafe au lait spots that are a centimeter or greater, you don't count the little baby ones. Um, if they have a large number of neurofibromas, axillary or inguinal freckling, optic glioma, again, you're not going to see that unless if you send them to an ophthalmologist, the lish nodules, changes in the bone, and if they have family history of this. And again, just a single normal neurofibroma, you see those a lot. And if you push on that, it just sink in, and almost like a buttonhole. Um, and then widespread neurofibromatosis. Any questions thus far? You need a break or anything yet? Want to just plug through if you need to go? All right, atopic dermatitis. We talked about this. Um, I just feel like in pediatrics we need to talk about it again because you, if you work in family medicine, urgent care, pediatrics, you are going to see this a lot. And so this is um, that type of eczema that's associated with atopy, seasonal allergies, hay fever, asthma, and skin rashes tends to occur, most of your kiddos are going to, this is going to start showing itself within the first year of life, and it tends to be very chronic, recurrently chronic, okay? There are going to be triggers that, that get it going, and then you'll get it under control, and then it'll flare back up. Paritis itching is hallmark. They, these kiddos are itchy and uncomfortable, and oftentimes that itchiness precedes anything any rash that you can see. So the red scaly papules and plaques from chronic scratching, they can get lichenification, that thickening of the skin. And again, it really likes those flexural surfaces. Um, infant, infants, it likes the, the cheeks. As they get older, it likes the backs of the knees, the backs of the um, elbows, especially. So if you see rashes here, you, you, so you have family history of, of asthma, allergies, hay fever. Did you, as a, as a when you, Mr. So and So, did you have rashes as a kiddo? We don't have a hundred percent lockdown. What drives this? But we do know a couple of things that these kiddos just have a, an overzealous immune system. They overreact to everything on their skin. <clears throat> and it gets that inflammatory cascade. We also know, we talked about the filaggrin gene, didn't we talk about that? Yeah, there's an abnormality with that, so they tend to lose water out of their skin very, very, very easily. Transepidermal water loss is increased. So, I can't emphasize how, much, how important it is for these parents to 
loop these babies up with a moisturizer multiple times a day. And it's the toughest thing to get them to do. But it's so, so important. Alright, so we know certain triggers when they get hot, um, when their skin gets extra dry in the winter months, when they get teeth, when they have a viral illness, when they start school and stress, all of these things are going to get their eczema to flare up. We used to, you know, years ago, say, okay, we, these kiddos who have skin like this, we only want you to bathe them once a week. We don't do that anymore. Um, it's fine to bathe them. I Now, keep the water less hot. You don't want it real hot because that kind of strips strips the, the natural oils off the skin. Harsh um, soaps will do that too. So use a very gentle soap and only use soap where you need it, the, the pits and the, the groin area. And if they're, you know, they've got mud all over them, then you might need it. But only use the soap in, in the areas where you need it. And as soon as they get out of the tub, lube them up with moisturizer. You know, kind of pat them dry and get a good moisturizer in there to, to trap that, that moisture in. Obviously, kiddos who have this skin, you don't want to be buying their their wash, their body wash at Bath and Body Works. Typically, you're going to use your steroids to calm down a, a, an active flare. I will usually say use this twice a day for two to three weeks. Once it's under control, then stop it. Sometimes then we'll use some of the non-steroidal calcium urine inhibitors, such as Eladel or Protopic, or we might use those on the face where we want to maybe avoid steroid. I might use localized high potency steroids if it's uh, real light kinified. I've even used that on the face before in like a teenager, but she had just a lot of light kinification on the face. So just for you know, a couple of weeks just to get it flattened down. Sedating and histamines. Again, these parents are exhausted because their kids are exhausted. They're not sleeping. They're up scratching all night long. If the baby's not sleeping, parents aren't sleeping, and the whole house is unhappy. So if you can help knock that kid out a little bit, I don't mean to sound callous, but, but the parents do appreciate that when their kids are sleeping better. Secondary infections. We talked about that. Bacterial staph. Um, we would, and, and these, because their, their barrier is already not as healthy, their skin barrier is not as healthy, they are way more prone to getting secondary infections with staph. Um, and you see it all the time. I oftentimes, especially if they're just repeatedly having these crusted up, oozy, oozy lesions, I will have them give them a Clorox bleach bath. And I, parents will look at me like, say, what? What do you want me to do with my kid? But just explain. This is like taking them to the swimming pool. You're making a swimming pool in the bathtub. Just that chlorine will help lower how the bacterial load on the skin. And it really does help. When you get a secondary bacterial infection on, in a, an area of eczema, it just, I mean, it's like throwing gasoline on fire. It just makes it it's so hard to control and get it under control until you manage the, the secondary infection. So I will sometimes say for the next two weeks, bleach bath every day. Once we get the secondary infection under control, then maybe three times a week for maintenance. You can also, I, we've talked about, you can get a secondary infection with herpes. And with that, I mean, any of these really severe kiddos, you're going to be referring on to a to a dermatologist, but those, here's your typical atopic dermatitis in, a, in an infant that likes those cheeks and then the antecubital areas. A little bit more like kenified and that screen right, I would almost guess that's a contact something because that is just so, you know, it's just so well defined. Um, but either one of those, especially screen right, they need some kind of an antibacterial something. If it's just localized there, I just use a topical. If it, they've got patches looking like that all over their body, an oral and bleach baths. Alright, so eczema herpeticum, when they have a secondary 
herpes infection. That is really going to look crusted up, angry, angry, angry. Um, does not respond well to your normal treatment. The only way to really tell if you've got a bacterial or viral is by getting a swab of that area. I would probably get two, one for bacteria, one for viral, and see what comes back. And you would treat, if it does come back positive for herpes, then you got to treat them with them intermittently with uh, oral antiviral. All right, KP or keratosis pilaris, that's another something that's very, very common. It's kind of associated with atopic dermatitis. I've got this a little bit. Um, this is where you get uh, the uh, folliculocentric, right around that hair follicle. You get redness and kind of this horny, oh, excuse me, just an accumulation of scale at the base of that hair follicle, like a, a little scale plug. Um, I do think this tends to get worse with hormones. I, I always see pre-teenagers coming in complaining about this. Again, they're hypersensitive to everything that's different on their body, but it does seem to get worse around that time. As kids get older, up into adulthood, that tends to get a little bit better. And atopic dermatitis, it does too. As they get older, it tends to get better in those people. Areas where you're going to see this KP is the upper arms, most commonly, and the lower cheeks, the thighs, the buttocks, it can be widespread. The redness is near impossible to get rid of, and that's usually what they dislike the most. Uh, the, the rough texture of it, we can use emollients that help to moisturize and help to break down that scale. So you use a lactic acid or a salicylic acid cream. Sebderm, we've talked about this. Um, we don't really know for sure, but we know it's associated with that malassezia or pitiris forum. <clears throat> it's kind of bimodal infants. They tend to get it on their scalp, cradle cap. In the, the adolescence, it tends to be more uh, dandruff, and then possibly in other areas where we have more oil production, more oil gland activity. some post-inflammatory hypopigmentation on that the black young man. And there's cradle cap. Kind of a variant of these uh, is called tinea amiantacea. And this is, tends to be more localized, but this scale is very thick. They call it asbestos-like very thick, uh, it, it incorporates a number of hair shafts, so then when they pick out that, that piece of scale, it plucks a number of hairs out. It looks pretty gross, um, and it tends to be recurrent. I'll show you a picture of it, and that's kind of what that looks like. It could be more widespread, but I'd say it tends to be more localized. Um, trying to break down that scale, moisturize it so you can get it out. Oftentimes what I'll do is a, there's, a, there's a steroid ointment or oil that I sometimes draw a blank on the name of it. Um, but to soften it and then wash it out with like salicylic acid, I do like to get some kind of a dandruff type of shampoo in there routinely as well. You can refer on it like did you guys talk about her vagina with the viral rash? This is just a, uh, multiple viruses can cause this. This is a real quick little, they get uh, ulcerations on the back of the throat, yellowish white vesicles, and again, those are going to pop real quickly, so it's going to look mainly like ulcerations. Uh, but this is gone in five to ten days. Uh, headache, sore throat, fever, Difficulty swallowing, you look in the back of the throat and they've got little ulcerations and this will go away without any treatment in five to ten minutes. That's what that looks like. Her pangina. I'm not going to talk about any of these, 
boom, boom, boom. Impetigo, we, you know that staff strap, honey colored crusting. Staph folliculitis. Warts, I hate them. <laughs> hate them, hate them, hate them. Again, we have um, a large number of HPV viruses that will cause this. Um, we have 18,000 different ways to try to get rid of them because there's not one really good method. I don't like to use excision or cautery if I can help it, um, especially on multiple lesions because I am promising you a scar and I still can't promise I'll get rid of the work. That has happened to me numerous times, but I'm very honest with them. Um, we have destructive methods such as liquid nitrogen, electrocautery, cutting off, cantheridin, which is that blistering agent from a beetle. All of those are called uh, destructive methods. We're trying to lift that up. When we have other immunotherapy methods where we're trying to get the immune system to get after these, and that would be like your squaric acid and DCP solution. Candida, bleomycin, topical imiquimod. So you might know the difference between those two methods. Okay? The examples of those, you've seen these very same pictures before. Molluscum, pox virus. I think what I would say with this is again, these lesions on the skin will aggravate, exacerbate eczema. If the kiddo is at all prone to eczema, this will get it, get it going. And if you have a kiddo whose eczema is just out of control, refer them to a dermatologist to get that under control before we start treating the, the uh, molluscum lesions. Because as long as they're scratching their eczema, they're spreading that virus around and it's, it's like a snowball. I'm not going to talk about this. I mean, it, it might be testable, but, you know, I'm not going to waste your time. You have had that, roseola, measles, rubella, rubella measles, fifth disease. Giannotti cross, crosty. This is a little something. Um, it's, there's a number of viruses that can cause this. Clinically, these are more flat-topped, pinkish to brownish papules, and these tend to be firm papules. They're more edematous. <clears throat> the, the important thing about that is sometimes they can get a, a hepatitis associated with this. So if you see this rash, or a rash that looks kind of like it, you might think about checking some liver enzymes. This tends to stick around a little bit longer and stick around for months. So again, look at that. That You've not really seen anything like that. Again, your little biliform, your uh, scarlet fever, those are pinpoint. This, these are bigger and more firm. Does that make sense? And they have a viral syndrome. Oh. Scarlet fever is a rash associated with strep throat. Usually lasts a few a couple of days after, or can start up to a couple of days after the sore throat starts. This is, once you see this, you will forever recognize it. These are pinpoint, very fine red papules, and their skin just feels like sandpaper. So if you see a rash like that, say, hey, have you been sick, had a sore throat? And I would treat them for strep or swab them or whatever. Um, tongue, your strawberry tongue, you might be familiar with that term. With strep throat, you tend to get this white membrane on, on the, the tongue that will slough off and then you tend to have that strawberry tongue. One thing I think to prepare parents for is after they have scarlet fever rash, they oftentimes the, the, will get, or the kiddo will get this formation, kind of a peeling action of their palms and soles a couple of weeks after they've been sick. So almost prepare for them for that, it could freak them out. And there's that scarlet fever rash. Again, if you would feel that, it feels like sandpaper. 
two more things and then we are done. Kawasaki disease. We don't really know. It's thought to be a reaction to an infection, but we don't really know what. 75% um, of these kiddos are young, below the age of four. It requires five out of six criteria. So a high fever that for the last five days or longer, and it's a stubborn fever. It's hard to get down. A rash, and the rash can look a lot of different ways. The rash is not specific at all. So if I if I have a rash up there, it's not going to be Kawasaki. You're going to have to get that out of the other history. Uh, rash stomatitis, so inflammation, redness, painfulness to the pharyngitis, have a strawberry tongue, um, fissuring chelitis, the, the cracks in the corner of the mouth, their mouth is just going to be very red. Swelling to the hands and feet, red eyes, conjunctivitis, and cervical adenopathy. So five out of six, you've got to have a, a lot of those before you make the diagnosis. So early on in the first 10 to 14 days, you get your high fever, and then the rash starts shortly thereafter. Again, the rash is not specific at all. It can look 18,000 different ways. <clears throat> but what's worrisome about this is that after about 10 to 14 days, as the rash and the, the fever starts resolving, it can cause inflammation to the heart muscle to the to the um, the arteries on the heart and you can have increased thrombocytes platelets and then you can get occlusion of vessels when you've got a lot of inflammation and in vessels and thick thick blood it doesn't lead to a good combo so these people are going to be admitted. Treatment is IVIG. You don't need to know that. I just want you to be familiar with what kind of signs and symptoms these kiddos. So you've got the red eyes. Look at that. That baby is not happy. That's an ill-looking baby. Red eyes, red mouth, painful mouth, stomatitis, angular chelitis, swelling to the feet and hands, strawberry tongue, cervical adenopathy, high fever, and rash. Six of those seven things. Last thing we're going to talk about is Henox Shonline purpura. <laughs> I know, God bless you. <laughs> um, again, young, young kiddos, usually four to eight years old, much more so in males. This is a form of vasculitis, inflammation of the blood vessels. Usually comes after a viral infection or a strep infection are common triggers. So palpable purpura is the, the textbook term you want to know. Purpura that are raised or you can feel the induration in them. Okay, palpable purpura. They also tend to have arthralgias in 75 to 85 percent abdominal pain and they get and renal disease. They can have bright red blood in the urine or in the stool. So this mottled palpable purpura, it extends our aspects of the arms and legs and buttocks. And this rash can continue for a couple of weeks to a month. With the arthralgias, you can actually have swelling to some of the joints, especially the knees and ankles. You can have crampy abdominal pain, diarrhea, melana, black tarry stools, or frank blo red blood in the stools, and microscopic or gross hematuria. So you always want to get a UA on somebody like this if you have any suspicions. So, not only do you have vasculitis inflammation of the veins of the skin, but you've got that occurring internally as well. So it can affect primarily the kidneys and the lungs and the GI tract and the central nervous system. 
people are going to usually be put on hefty dosages of steroid and taper over a pretty long period of time, but you need to watch them closely for um, progressive renal disease. So if you have somebody with hematuria and this rash, you need to, to watch them. And there you go. Again, that, this is going to be bright red to almost a, a purpley red color. And again, if you, now you may not feel all of those, but at least some of those, you're going to be able to feel some elevation. Okay? So that, that nothing else looks like that. Oh, I lied. I'm sorry. <laughs> totally, I forgot about this. Okay, tinny cavitus. We know about this black dot appearance. The hair, do you need a break? Okay. The, you get these annular patches of hair loss. It tends to break low down by the um, scalp, so it has this black dot appearance. Scaly, the carry-on, there was a test question about the carry-on. Um, the tender, boggy, nodule, purulent. Adenopathy, T tonsorans, trichophyton tonsorans, that was another question on there. One thing, I felt like in clinical practice, I felt like they were oftentimes, if they were not resolving, I felt like oftentimes they were being undertreated. Mm -hmm. And I think that with the oral grizzle fulvin, you need 20 milligrams per kilogram of, of body weight. And I think oftentimes they don't give that much. And again, you need to give it for two months. Again, I'm going to kind of breeze through. Alopecia, alopecia areata, we've talked about that. You don't have the black dot. Um, you don't have redness, scaling, inflammation, just very acute hair loss. It's thought to be autoimmune, so it's associated with some other autoimmune things. You might be familiar with that exclamation point hair. Just know the term can be associated with nail pinning. Intralesional or topical steroids are probably treatment of choice for localized, and then you have to get into some other things for widespread, but you're going to be referring these on. Just FYI, they do, they have a, they're studying for a new uh, biologic medi medicine for this. It's not approved yet, but it's, it's in the works. Trichotillomania, that's one thing we did not talk about hair and nails. Trichotillomania, we tend to see more in kiddos or adolescents. This is kind of an OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, when they might be under stress or they just have that personality tendency. Um, this is where they have hair that breaks off. I know, I'm always doing this. <laughs> I always do my hair like that. I know. From uh, chronic <laughs> twisting or pulling, or they will outright pull their hair out. <clears throat> One thing to, to note on this is oddly shaped patches of hair loss with hairs at different lengths. Okay? And I'll show you. See how, especially that the eyebrow. I mean, that doesn't look like complete hair loss. There's no redness, there's no scaling. You've got hairs of so many different lengths in there. Okay? So that's kind of textbook. You don't want to be asking about their home life, how school, how's your home life, or your parents go, you know, or mom and dad, are you going through divorce, or you know, delve into that. Traction alopecia is another type of hair loss. Um, due to tension on the hair, um, tight ponytails, um, black kiddos tend to have weaves and braids that are real tight and that can encourage the, the breakage and sometimes can even lead for long term if they do that for over years can actually lead to scarring, a, the cicatricial alopecia. Um, sometimes too, I didn't have this in here, but sometimes you will see little pustules as well. And it's not a, it's, it's probably more inflammatory, it's not a bacterial thing. So that traction, that tightness, 
causes the hair shaft to fracture and possibly follicular damage, especially at the temples and above the, above the ears. So you need to talk to them about changing their hairstyle so that they, this doesn't eventually turn into a, a scarring permanent hair loss that can't be resolved. Okay, now I'm done. <laughs> All right, questions about anything? Nope. Okay, thank you so much. I love, love it.